Okay, Prithanda. Uh, good afternoon. Croeso Cunis Yanni Drum, Prithanda. Sorry, I'm a decorate brain here. On my dewey plesia, yawn, 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 kavluino, yawn, shradwe, heddy. And I should remember which language I'm speaking, shouldn't I? Yes. <laughs> It comes from having technical thoughts. Very warm welcome to the drum. Um, it's very lovely to see you all here. Sorry about the bit of a late start. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my, our speaker today, who actually, uh, her office is opposite mine, so uh, I see her every single day, so which is really nice. So Lucy, she's been with us for three years. She's um, uh, an archivist, Diana Forleant, a trainee archivist who is doing the course in Aberystwyth as well. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce her talk, which is The Vikings in Wales, Cultural Perspective. So thank you very much to Lucy. So, and um, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, so this talk started as a straightforward enterprise and has ended up being uh, what I would term politely and academically as very wide ranging. So apologies for that. Um, and that's because it's been a while really since this topic was explored. Um, recent studies such as those by Mark Redknapp and Nancy Edwards have hugely expanded what we know from the archeological record. And there have been excellent literary studies from academics such as Wendy Davis, Judith Jess and Carrie Morn. But the last expansive look at this topic was arguably Henry Lloyd's paper, The Vikings in Wales, which was written in 1976. So it seems it's high time to revisit the topic and I'll be reinforcing some already well-established ideas and hopefully introducing some new ones. This talk aims to explore Norse culture in medieval Wales and how and where Wales featured in the Old Norse world. In order to do this, I'll be looking at different types of sources from both Wales and Scandinavia, including, of course, many that can be found here in the National Library. So we all perhaps have that stereotypical view of the Vikings, bloodthirsty pillagers, destroying towns, laying waste to crops and stealing valuables. Even their literary taste was considered violent. The 18th century Welsh poet and antiquarian Edward Williams, otherwise known as Yolo Morganog, whose papers can also be found here in the library, described Viking poetry as containing far-fetched metaphors, violent figures and ferocious sentiments. To some extent, this is an accurate representation. The Vikings were seafaring people who came over to the British Isles from around the 8th to the 11th centuries, mainly from the Scandinavian countries of Norway and Denmark. In medieval Latin texts, the word Viking is interchangeable with the word pirate, demonstrating that this association with violence and law-breaking is definitely not a modern one. But as the Welsh academic Gwyn Jones pointed out, the history of the Vikings was often written by their enemies. The most prolific history writers in the early medieval period were, of course, monks, and monasteries where histories were produced suffered disproportionately from Viking raids, including in Wales, ecclesiastical centres such as St David's. Monasteries, as both the main Viking targets and the main producers of written histories, did not have any reason to present the Vikings in a favourable light. Because of this, and because of the temporal gap between sources and the events they describe, we have to question their reliability. So it's no wonder that the Vikings had a bad press but there is also plenty of truth in their violent image. The 12th century Icelandic Landnama book, literally meaning the land naming book, which describes Icelandic settlers coming from Norway, gives an idea of what Vikings were actually like by providing examples of real Viking names. So we've got Onund Broadbeard, Bursi the Godless, Sigurd Hogshead, uh, Strife Bjorn, <laughs> sounds like a charming fellow, um, Tengil the Fast Sailing, Gunstein Berserkskilla, Bolvok Blind Snout, Thorstein Tent Pitcher, um, Aud the Deep Minded, and Freystein the Handsome. I think Aud the Deep Minded is my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, showcasing a variety of skills there. Um, so, there is plenty of evidence to confirm <laughs> this stereotype of the Vikings as plunderers, thieves, and pirates. But the Norsemen who came to Wales did not only take from other cultures, they also left behind traces of their own. Their religion, their language, their worldly possessions, and even their art. Burials, place names, manuscripts, and histories all offer clues about Viking culture in Wales and how Wales was part of the Old Norse world. <laughs> 
So according to both the E and F versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the first recorded contact with Vikings in the British Isles was when a small fleet described as Northmen from Hordaland near Bergen in western Norway landed on the Dorset coast in 789. And the first recorded raid was at the Monastery of Lindisfarne on the Northumbrian coast in 793. Their raids continued to expand further, and by the early 9th century, Viking attacks were being widely recorded, and Norse settlements had begun to establish themselves in Ireland and on the Isle of Man. The earliest visits to Wales began around the same time, as access to the Western British Isles opened up trading routes around the Irish Sea, with Anglesey and St David's as the earliest and most prominent targets. By the 11th century, and during the time of the Welsh king Griffith ap Canaan, the Vikings were established enough in Wales to earn their own Welsh name, Llachlanwyr, first recorded in Welsh as a description in a 13th century manuscript of Historia Griffith ap Canaan, otherwise known as Peniarth MS 17, which is kept here at the library. The Welsh description of Llachlin, with Llyn presumably referring to bodies of water, is thought to represent the steep fjordlands of the western coast of Norway, the main starting point for the earliest Norse westward excursions and fitting in with the description seen in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. This is also reflected in medieval Irish sources, such as the fragmentary Annals of Ireland and the Annals of Ulster, which both appear to refer to Norway as Lochlan. In order to understand Viking culture, we need to look first at why they came to Wales and how they got here. Henry Loyne suggested that, from the point of view of the Scandinavian world, Wales came substantially at the end of a long colonising trek down the western shores of Britain, and that the purpose of the Vikings in Wales was to secure new land and to establish fortified markets at which to trade their goods. There is much debate as to why people, many of them ordinary farmers and fishermen, chose to leave Scandinavia and travel to the British Isles to plunder and eventually to settle. Loin's theory is confirmed, however, in saga literature. The slopes of the western Norwegian fjords were difficult to farm, and land was heavily fought over and controlled by petty kings. The saga of Haukon the Good, found in the Icelander Snorri Sturluson's 13th century saga compilation Heimskringla, described the 10th century farmers of western Norway as complaining that land could not be cultivated and that there was a shortage of food. And Landnamabok describes how people left Norway during the 10th century to claim land in Iceland. Closer to Wales, Ireland had established Norse settlements as early as the 830s, and a century later was host to a large Scandinavian contingent centred in Norse-controlled Dublin. So the Welsh coast formed the final stop on a long route which began in Norway and included the wild coastlines of Shetland, Orkney, Scotland, Ireland, the Isle of Man and North West England. This route features in Old Norse literature, with the 14th century Orkneying saga, or the saga of the Earls of Orkney, describing journeys from western Norway over Shetland and Orkney to the Irish Sea and as far south as Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel. In the early medieval period, such a journey would seem like a dangerous undertaking. But one of the reasons that the Norsemen were so successful was because of their superior ability as sailors and shipbuilders. In fact, in Haukon's saga, the Viking Eivinder boasts that it took longer for him to eat breakfast than it did for him to set sail. <laughs> Viking ships were built using the clinker method, where planks of wood, usually oak, were layered in an overlapping pattern before being riveted. This provided their ships with a great strength and flexibility, eventually enabling long-distance sea travel, not only to the British Isles, but also to the edge of the known medieval world. Across Europe to the Middle East, north to Greenland, east to Russia, and even across the Atlantic to the Americas. One of the best preserved examples of a Viking ship is the 70 foot long oak built Oseberg ship, which was found in a burial mound in Tunsberg, Norway, in 1904. Analysis estimates that the ship was built in around the year 800 and buried in about 834, so it's feasible that this type of ship was available to the first Vikings who would have been sailing to Wales. The ship's construction is so finely tuned that it was not until 2012 that a working copy was successfully completed. The ship itself, intricately carved and exquisitely built, is an indication of the level of craftsmanship and artwork of the Vikings, giving a glimpse into the skills and culture of the people who were sailing to Wales. There's evidence that these shipbuilding skills were brought to Wales by the Vikings and used here, 
As the, archae as the archaeological study by Mark Redknapp has pointed out, large iron nails and rivets identical to Viking Age ship fastenings dating from the 9th or 10th centuries have been found at a site at San Gorg on Anglesey. Unfortunately, attempting to portray the Vikings as anything other than violent attackers is hindered by the antics of the Vikings themselves. <laughs> <laughs> From the Welsh perspective, the appearance of the Normaniaid, the Northmen, brought with it war and strife, as the Vikings approached, which was nearly always to attack and start burning things, not surprisingly caused clashes with the local populations. <laughs> Strategic coastal areas were the most prominent targets. The 13th century Welsh chronicle Brutatoa Sogion, which is kept here in the library, tells us in an apocalyptic description that in 810, during the same period that the Oseberg ship was active, St David's was sacked and burned for the first time. And for the next 200 years, this experience was regularly repeated with varying degrees of severity. Um, so this is a description of one of the earliest Viking attacks on St David's in Brutatoa Sogion. Um, so, Degnan is at Oith Kant, Oithoid Christ, from the Diauda Sayad, Dean the Doric, a Kasosket Manu, a Kaviva Wallace, a Rescribble, and Horse and Espradine. So, 800 was the year, 810 was the year of Christ when the moon darkened on Christmas Day, and Manavia was burnt, and there was a mortality upon all the animals of Britain. So, a really apocalyptic description there of the burning of uh, Manavia or St. David's. Another favourite target was Anglesey due to both its proximity via sea to Dublin and its position as the gateway to Wales from the north. According to the Brute, Anglesey was first attacked in 855, likely by Vikings who had travelled via Ireland, and the annals of Ulster tell us that the next year, the Welsh king Rodriat Merovin, or Rodri Maur, defeated and killed the Danish leader Gorm, who had been based on the Isle of Man, when he tried to attack Gwynedd in 856. But Rodri's victory did nothing to allay further attacks in North Wales. Again, religious centres such as Holyhead were the initial victims, but it wasn't long before the Norsemen looked inland. In the search for land, looting religious centres was a means to an end. If land was to be bought or bartered, wealth was required, which would explain why wealthy monasteries were attacked first, although the lack of defences might also have explained that. <laughs> but the Vikings became bolder as they grew more familiar with the Welsh coast, and land became a commodity that could be taken by force. The A text of the Annals Cumbriae, compiled in the 12th century, tells us that in 902, a certain Viking named Ingmundur came to Anismorn and seized a tract of land at Mice Osvelion. Following this, the early 10th century was a turning point for Norse control over the Welsh coast. From the Welsh perspective, the Brutatoisogion chronicles of both the Red Book of Hergest, which is kept at Jesus College, Oxford, and Peniach 20, were both likely copied from a Latin original. Describe they both described how in 918, Ireland and Anglesey were ravaged by the folk of Dublin, which meant that Wales' invaders were no longer only first-generation Scandinavians, but also second- and third-generation Hiberno-Norse. This cultural blend caused trouble for native Welsh kings. Borders and boundaries either side of the Irish Sea constantly shifted, making it difficult for Welsh kings to make claim for either Welsh or Norse-controlled lands. This is reflected in contemporary textual sources. Nowhere is this cultural blend more apparent than in the 12th century description of the Welsh king Griffith ap Cynan, preserved in two manuscripts kept here at the National Library. In Welsh, the Historia Griffith ap Cynan in Penarth MS 17, or in Latin, the Vita Griffini Fini Conani, which was translated from Penarth MS 434 by Paul Russell in 2005. Griffith's history begins with his supposed complete genealogy, which includes Welsh, Irish and Norse lineages. Griffith's mother was Ragnes, or in Old Norse, Ragnhilde, the daughter of Olaf, who is described as King of Dublin, Denmark, the Scottish Western Isles, Anglesey and Gwynedd, and also claims ancestry through the Norwegian king, Harald Halfangre, known as Harald Fairhair. Griffith's father, Cunan, was described as King of Gwynedd and descended from a long line of Welsh and ancient British kings, which typically for a medieval genealogy, the author traced all the way back to the biblical Adam. Not only did the Vita Graffini use this genealogy to bridge the physical divide between kingdoms, it also crossed a religious divide. In Griffith's time, much of Scandinavia was still pagan. Denmark had not begun to convert to Christianity until at least the 9th century, while Norway's conversion did not take place until the 11th. The first Scandinavian diocese was established during Griffith's lifetime at Lund, Sweden, then Denmark, 
1104. Therefore, many of Wales's Viking visitors would have been followers of the pagan Norse religion. The early 13th century Latin history of Norway, Historia Norvegiae, which was written in Norway not long after the Vita Gravini, described Griffin's apparent ancestor, Harald Halfagra, or Harald Fairhair, as a descendant of the Norse god Odin. This theme is overwhelmingly prevalent in Old Norse histories, so the author of the Vita Graffini would almost certainly have been aware of his connection when claiming that Griffith was descended from both Adam and Odin. The basis of his claim is, of course, negligible, but this connection does show political motive. In Old Norse <laughs> histories, Harold Fairhair, who lived from around circa 850 to circa 932, was widely reported to have become the first true king of all Norway due to his connections to the Norse gods. It's possible that by connecting Griffith to Harold, the author of the Vita Gravini was attempting to also afford Griffith this right as part of his Scandinavian heritage. So according to the Vita, Griffith was born and raised in Dublin before returning to Wales to stage a series of raids and battles to reclaim his father's kingdom of Gwynedd, which had more than its fair share of invaders. By far the most widely reported battle from this period was the clash off the coast of Anglesey between Hugh of Ranch, the Earl of Chester, Hugh de Montgomery, the Earl of Shrewsbury, and the Norwegian king Magnus Barfoyter, known as Magnus Barefoot, in 1098. This conflict gives us a number of clues as to the meetings of Norse and Welsh culture in the Viking Age. The Norman Earls, here of course represented as the French, had invaded Anglesey intent on capturing Gwynedd but had been met by Griffith and his men, aided by a Hiberno-Norse fleet. This fleet, bribed by Hugh of Chester, then betrayed Griffith, causing him to flee back to Ireland, but the Earl's forces were then met by Magnus, who is described as the King of Llochlin, and who, according to the Vita Gravini, had appeared, apparently completely coincidentally, at that very moment to invade Wales himself. The Welsh version of the Vita, Historia Griffith Vab Cynan, describes how Magnus's Viking army left the French an ofnaug fel as fearful as women, and how Magnus killed Hugh of Shrewsbury by shooting him in the eye with an arrow, stating, Avrathas a saith hu yalam wythig an asagad. It's interesting to note that Old Norse texts add a considerable amount of embellishment to this deed, with the 13th century Norse history Algip Afnoris Kanungasogum claiming that Magnus's men remarked what a good shot he was and how they came away from Anglesey laden with gold, silver and many costly things. Likewise, the 13th century Icelandic saga Magnus Saga Barefoot describes how Magnus won Anglesey, which was as far as the furthest south the previous kings that had ever been in Norway had gained power, and even goes on to claim that in winning Anglesey, Magnus then controlled a full third of Wales. In fact, Magnus's deed was so widely reported that on some occasions this appears to have caused translation difficulties. The scribe of the Penyarth MS 20 version of Brutito Sogion actually reverses the story and tells us that it was Earl Hugh that shot Magnus in the face, a mistake that is not repeated by the scribes of either the Red Book of Hergist nor the closely related Welsh chronicle Brenhine the Saison, even though it's likely that all three were copied from the same sources. That the battle was so well reported is perhaps due to a shared cultural interest, that of poetry, the early medieval poetic tradition in Norway was as old and as developed as that in Wales, and they drew upon similar source materials. The bloody battles and mead swigging of an Aerin's Gododin, for example, would not be out of place in a Viking saga. Poets were often present on the battlefield, giving rare contemporary accounts of the action, with some even joining in. The Icelandic sagas of Heimskringla describe how the 10th century Norwegian king Haukon the Good was accompanied in battle by his warrior poet Ivan der Finsen, who was in fact so talented a poet that he is descripted as that he's depicted as composing complex verses at the same time as dispatching his enemies. <laughs> it's quite a feat though. The Vita Graffini describes how the pen carath, or court poet Gellam, was killed during a raid on Anglesey when accompanying his employer Griffith Ap Cunham. Nevertheless, despite the dangers, a resident poet was a must-have and both Griffith and Magnus Barefoot employed a bars or a skald. It's their poetry which gives the liveliest account of events. The works of the poet Maelir, who was also in the service, service of Griffith ap Cynan, can be found in the manuscript NLWMS 6680B, otherwise known as the Hendrik Adred manuscript, which is kept here at the library. 
Mailer's eulogy for Griffith, Marunad Griffith ap Canan, provides a powerful description of war. Gwern Grigid, Gwenai Bao Benigilis, Gwaid Gwir Goverai, Gwirai Onwith. So spears were shattered, each one rushed at the other. The blood of warriors flowed, ash spears drooped. Similarly, Magnus Barefoot's poet Gisel Elugason gives an eyewitness description of the death of Hugh of Shrewsbury in his Erefic Vaidi, or eulogy, for Magnus. Margan hov du Magnus Lidar, Biotum oli boi vang skiorin, Vard heltoch a hlif a springa, Kaups vas skifud fier konungs dare. Magnus's men had cut many a shield with bright point. The earl's protection, very well decorated, had to split before the king's dart. So that's a very ornate description of shooting an arrow at someone's head. <laughs> the intricacies of poetic composition seem a far cry from the traditional image of the Vikings as violent pirates. But the skaldic art was one of the most coveted cultural institutions in medieval Scandinavia. Such was the value of Old Norse poetry that in the 1220s, the Icelander Snorri Sturluson of Heimskringla fame composed the work Skaldskapamal, or The Language of Poetry, a sort of poet's handbook which explained in detail different types of Old Norse poetic metre and their uses. Gisela Lugason's eulogy was composed in Fornilislag, or ancient words form metre, which required two alliterative syllables in each line. Medieval Welsh, of course, also had a proud tradition of metrical forms and kanghanes. For comparison, the Welsh poet Mailer's eulogy also follows a metrical formula, that of the Cahydde Nauban, which requires lines of nine syllables of equal length to form rhyming couplets. A discussion of Welsh and Norse poetics would require far more knowledge than I have to do it justice, but this brief comparison between Mailer and Gisel's work shows that the poetic art, as a common form in both medieval Wales and medieval Scandinavia, shared far more similarities than we might realise. <coughs> the production of poetry demonstrates that the Vikings who came to Wales were more than just bothersome pirates. As well as their poetry, battle sites along the Welsh coast have revealed that Norse culture in Wales was possessed of the most intricate art forms. In 1991, a brass sword hilt was found at Small's Reef off the Pembrokeshire coast. The design of the hilt matches a medieval Norwegian art form known as the Ernest style, named after carvings at Ernest Church at Sungfjord on the western coast of Norway. The church dates to circa 1130, and the use of the same design style dates the hilt to around 1050 to 1150, the same period that Magnus Barefoot and Griffith ap Cunan were active and fighting their wars. As I've previously mentioned, we know that the Vikings who visited Wales did frequently come from Western Norway, and Orkneying our saga tells us that Magnus Barefoot himself sailed from this area to Wales. Although similar designs do feature in medieval Irish art forms, which were also influenced by Norse settlers, the closeness and date of the earnest carvings and the similarity of the design suggests a Norwegian rather than an Irish influence. This theory also fits in with the idea that many Vikings sailing to the Irish Sea were following an established route from Western Norway. The Smalls Reef sword hilt isn't the only example of Viking art in Wales. It's also worth mentioning that a copper alloy belt buckle found at the Sanberg Gorch site on Anglesey featured early 10th century artwork in the Scandinavian Bora style, which also originated in southwestern Norway. This discussion of war and weapons has highlighted the friction between the Welsh and their Viking visitors. But not all Welsh and Norse clashes ended in violence, and cultural institutions such as marriage were used by both the Welsh and the Vikings to forge alliances as well as feuds. A representation of this is found in the 13th century Old Norse Jomsvikinga saga, which describes the deeds of the Vikings of the town of Jomsborg, which is thought to have been located on an island in the Baltic Sea. The saga tells us of the 10th century exploits of a Viking known as Polnatoki, who is harrying the Welsh coast one summer. According to the saga, a Viking known as Stefnir was ruling in Wales, and his daughter had a local councillor known as Björn the Welshman. The saga tells us the tale of how this Björn arranged a marriage between Polnatoki and the Jomsviking settlers in Wales. At that time, Wales was ruled by an earl named Stefnir, who had a wise and popular daughter called Alof, 
Polna Turkey landed there with his ships and intended to ravage Earl Stephanie's kingdom. When they heard of this, Erlof and Bjorn the Welshman, who was their counsellor, decided to invite him to a banquet and to bestow great honour on him. They suggested also that he should regard it as a friendly territory and that he should not harry there. This was accepted by Polnatoki, who attended the banquet with all his men. At the banquet, Polnatoki asked for Alof's hand and the suit was readily granted. Polnatoki stayed there that summer and the following winter. So, Bjorn the Welshman presents an intriguing character. It's not made clear whether Bjorn is a Welshman bestowed with a Viking name or a Viking settler who lived in Wales or perhaps Britain long enough to earn the title. Whether Bjorn or Palnatoki were real historical characters is definitely disputable, but for whatever reason, the story highlights the connection between Viking settlers and their adopted country and gives a glimpse into how, no how Norse communities might have developed in Wales. There are two aspects to this tale that make it important. Firstly, it provides evidence of a connection between Wales and the Vikings of the Baltic. There is a wide base of evidence, as we have seen, demonstrating that the Vikings visiting Wales were mainly from Western Scandinavia, that is, mainly Norway and Denmark. But Jomsvikingar saga provides a rare account of a Welsh connection with the wider Eastern European Viking communities and shows that from the Norse perspective, Wales was included as part of a much larger diaspora than perhaps you might think. Secondly, the story highlights a connection between the Viking settlers depicted and their adopted country. The character Polnatoki is shown as marrying into an already established Viking community in Wales. In the saga, Polnatoki spends the winter in Wales before moving on back to Jomsborg. So far, this talk has discussed Vikings as visitors to Wales rather than permanent settlers or migrants. I mentioned earlier that Ireland had already developed an extensive Norse community by the early 10th century, and Jomsvikingar saga tells us that around the same time, Vikings started overwintering in Wales. Traditionally, it was the custom for Vikings to carry out raids in the summer, when the weather was more favourable and the days longer, and then spend the winter there before making their way back home to Scandinavia with whatever they could take back. As Wales became more familiar, these overwintering episodes grew longer, until eventually Wales's Viking raiders became the settlers. Viking communities in Wales, such as the one possibly described by Jomsvikingar saga, left behind relatively few traces, but the clues that they did leave behind can tell us a great deal about Viking culture. So as I mentioned earlier, a big part of this culture was the Old Norse religion. As Norway did not officially convert to Christianity until the 11th century, Wales's Viking visitors would probably not have been Christianised, and this is made very clear in medieval Welsh texts. Monastic centres were repeatedly attacked and holy men were slain unmercilessly. For example, Brutito Sogion tells us that in the year 999, Morgenai, the Bishop of St David's, was attacked and slain by Vikings. But the writers of history, namely monks, responded to this threat by reinforcing Christian beliefs and the notion of divine punishment. Both the Brute and the Annals Cambriae describe how, after the Viking attack which destroyed St David's in 810, the moon darkened on Christmas Day and there was a mortality among all the animals of Britain. The Latin Vita Sancti Gunle, or the life of St Gwynto, which was probably written in the early 12th century during the lifetime of Griffith ap Canang, described how Griffith, spurred on by his Viking friends from Ireland, gathered a fleet in the Severn Channel for a raid and was consequently punished for it. So they, these are the Vikings, they sailed under Griffith's command through the Irish Sea and after an endless and fear-fraught voyage arrived in the Severn Channel which washes the banks of the Glamorgan folk. The iniquitous pirates, seeing that the church of St Gwyneth was barred, reckoning that precious articles were inside for safety and protection, broke the bar. Whatever precious and useful thing was found, they took. When from this place they began to hoist sails, they saw a single being, one terrible, riding day and night, and pursuing them on every side. That terrible rider was Holy Gwyntil, who had been sent from heaven to withstand the sacrilegious ones. The sails could not face the winds for their raging violence. Conversely, the author of the Vita Graffini, writing not long after Gwyntil's Vita was written, attempts to make up for this by describing how Griffith atoned for his sins on his deathbed and donated large amounts of money to monasteries in Ireland, Shrewsbury, Chester, Anglesey and Gwynedd. And I quote, 
so that they might be defended by the protection of the Holy Spirit, who sees and knows all things. With this in mind, it's easy to see how there could have been a religious clash between Welsh and Viking cultures. An idea of this religious clash can be illustrated by a case study of a site local to us here in Ceredigion. You would not expect to find a Viking grave in a Christian churchyard, but surprisingly, such a thing can be found not too far from Aberystwyth. Down the coast, high on a hill above the village of Aberarth, sits the church of Llandewi. The church is recorded as being on this site as early as the 13th century, but the site is probably much earlier as it contains fragments of an early Christian Celtic cross, which dates from the 9th or 10th centuries. The dating of these fragments show that there was already likely a religious site there during Wales's most intense period of Viking activity in the 10th century. The site contains an example of a Viking hogback burial stone, which are usually found in Norse settlement areas in northern England and western Scotland, but are exceptionally rare in Wales and Ireland. In fact, the Aberar stone, which is thought to date from the late 10th century, is the only confirmed example of its kind in Wales. The stone was found to have been used to build part of the wall in the old church when it was demolished and rebuilt in 1860, following which it was moved and used as a fancy garden feature in the rockery until about 1896, and it's now kept safe inside the church. These type of grave markers, known as hogbacks due to their shape, were designed to represent the curved shape of a Viking house, possibly intended to look like the mead halls of Valhalla in the Viking afterlife. The stones were often carved with tile shapes and patterns in order to look more house-like. So that image of the stone on the left, um, the stone originally would have been the other way up. Um, and it's actually quite small. It's probably just under a metre in length. Um, so it's actually quite a small grave cover. Um, but I'm sure when it was originally carved a thousand years ago, it probably looked a lot more impressive. Um, but the Aberarth stone throws up something of a mystery as to how and why it got there. The marking of a burial and the use of local stone as a permanent monument suggests that whoever carved it had spent a not inconsiderable period of time in Wales. Hogback grave covers are not found anywhere in Scandinavia and were typically erected by migrant Norse communities living in Britain, which suggests that the Averard stone was the feature of a more permanent settlement. Its position on an already established religious site also indicates this, although this throws up the question of religious orientation given the links of the hogback design to Valhalla and Norse paganism. But it was not unknown for Vikings who had converted to Christianity to continue to use both pagan and Christian imagery. The 10th century Gosforth cross in Cumbria, for example, has carvings on it depicting the Norse gods of Loki, Thor and Heimdall, juxtapositioned with a depiction of the crucifixion of Christ. It's also likely that this type of mixed religious imagery was used by second and third generation Scandinavian settlers, who identified as Christian, but still wanted to honour the culture of their ancestors. Unfortunately, the original position of the Aberar stone has been lost, so it's impossible to tell whether it was placed in either a Christian or a pagan orientation. But there are further features of the Aberar stone which can tell us more about it. Unlike most hogback stones in England and Scotland, which are carved with tile shapes, the Aberar stone is carved with horizontal lines, representing the clinker-style planking on a ship rather than the tiles on a house. In addition to this, the elevated position of San Lerri Aberarth on the Ceredigion coast, which provides exceptional views of Cardigan Bay, suggests that the Norse people who placed the stone were seafarers rather than a settled community, which ties in well with the 10th century dating of the stone. Further clues as to the age and the cultural background of hogback stone grave markers can be found in Old Norse literature. The Old Norse poem Ynglingatal, or the enumeration of the Ynglings, is a funeral poem describing the successive deaths and burials of Scandinavian kings. It was composed in Norway by a skald called Theodor Fini in the first quarter of the 10th century, so only a generation or so before the suggested date for the placing of the Aberath stone. It's a long poem, but the fourth verse is particularly relevant. Og vispos vilja birdi, Saiva nidir svelja knauti, Thaus meinhjof marka utu, Setet verinde aur sin fyrdur, Och asfald i arin kjuri, Glyrda garme glimjunga bait. And the kinsmen of the sea swallowed the ship of the will of Visbeth, 
when the defenders of the seat incited the harmful thief of the forest against their father, and the roaring dog of embers bit the sovereign within the hearth ship. So this verse describes, in a very ornate way, the death of the ancient Norse king, Fiesberg, who is burnt to death by his rivals inside his own house, um, which is a common theme in Old Norse literature, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but what's significant here is one of the verses, kennings. A kenning was a poetic metaphor which was used to describe everyday things in an elaborate way. So there are several in this verse. So we've got kinsmen of the sea um, is fire, so that's fire, water being partners. Um, the ship of the will, heart, that's quite a complicated one. Um, defenders of the seat for rulers. Um, thief of the forest is a kenning for fire. Um, and roaring dog of embers is also a kenning for fire. Um, and hearth ship is a kenning for house. This kenning shows that there was a close cultural connection between the ship and the house, particularly for Vikings who may have spent long periods of time away from home, where their ships would have been possibly their only domestic connection. This idea of the ship and the home being interchangeable must have been fairly prevalent in Old Norse culture in order for it to have been made into a kenning. The appearance of this kenning in a funeral poem also links this with the imagery of the ship or house as a grave marker. Furthermore, the composition of the poem is contemporary with the most intense period of Viking raids on Wales during the first half of the 10th century, suggesting that these aspects of Norse cultural identity could have been brought over to Wales by first-generation Vikings. Additionally, in Old Norse literature, there are numerous examples of stones being used as grave markers or as gateways to the Norse afterlife. For example, Haukon Saga recounts the death and burial of the 10th century Norwegian king, Haukon the Good. And soon after, King Haukon died there on the slab of rock where he had been born. His friends moved his body north to Seihamer in Norther Hordaland and raised a great mound there and laid the king in it with all his arms and best attire, but no other goods. They spoke over his burial as the custom of heathen people was and directed him to Valhut. This passage fits in with the idea of the hogback stone representing the gateway to the Hall of Valhalla and the afterlife. Inglingar Saga, the saga of the Inglings, found in Heimskringlar, confirms this with a description of the death of the ancient Scandinavian king Svegnir, who it claims walked into a stone hoping to find the land of the gods and vanished forever. Svegnir went to look for Godheimer again, and in the eastern part of Svifjord, there was a large farm called Stein at the stone. There is a stone there as big as a large house. In the evening after sunset, when Svegnir left the drinking to go to his sleeping chamber, he looked towards the stone and saw a dwarf sitting under it. Svegdir and his men were very drunk and ran towards the stone. The dwarf stood in the doorway and called to Svegdir, telling him to go there if he wanted to meet Odin. Svegdir ran in and the stone immediately closed behind him and Svegdir never came out. So, drunken exploits aside, we can see there's a clear link between the stone grave markers and the Viking afterlife. Looking at the evidence, it's safe to suggest that the hogback stone in Ceredigion is an example of the export of Old Norse culture into Wales. But despite its strategic coastal vantage point, Ceredigion was not a first choice for Viking settlement. And with Gwynedd to the north and Pembrokeshire to the south, the area around Aberarth wasn't a prime target for Viking raids. In the 10th century, Ceredigion came under the rule of Howell ap Cadell, also known as Howell Tha or Howell the Good, as part of the Kingdom of Dehebarth, which affected Viking activity. King Howell is best known for his role in the codification of medieval Welsh law, several manuscripts of which are, of course, found here at the library. But he was also frequently associated with the court of the Anglo-Saxon king Athelstan. Athelstan fought a constant battle against the Norse in Wessex and in neighbouring Mercia. Therefore, there was little chance that Howell would have welcomed any kind of permanent Viking alliance, which could have led to settlement. There's also no evidence from place names that a Norse settlement ever existed in Ceredigion. But we do know that the Vikings definitely came here. Brutitoris Sogion, for example, tells us that Sambadan Vaur was attacked by Vikings in the year 988, again fitting in with the dating of the Hogback Stone. Although the scarcity of Hogback Stones in Ireland makes it unlikely that the Vikings at Abrath were Hiberno Norse, there's also evidence that the coast of southwest Wales was included in Norse trade around the Irish Sea. Following the discovery in 1997 of an Irish-style copper alloy ringed pin at Penarthur near St David's. 
thought to date from the early 10th century. The pin is very similar to others found in North Wales, showing a possible trading connection from Ireland which incorporated Cardigan Bay. During the Viking Age, Aberard itself was part of a more local trade route due to its extensive network of fish traps, and a charter granted in 1184 by three sap griffiths of De Hebar confirms that the traps served Strata Florida Abbey across an inland route. The route became known as the Lawn Lax, the fish lane, with lax deriving from the Old Norse word lax, meaning salmon, so that's L-A-X, lax. So it's possible that the Viking stone at Aberarf was placed there by Norsemen, taking advantage of its excellent trading position due to the fish traps. It seems safe to conclude, then, that the hogback stone at Aberarf was likely made by Vikings staying in the area temporarily, either to take advantage of the coastal position for trade, or by those overwintering before returning via Ireland and Western Scotland to Scandinavia. That's not to say there weren't any permanent Viking settlements in Wales. For comparison, the extensive excavation at San Medregorch in Anglesey produced numerous items such as coins, hack silver, brooches and bells, as well as human burials, which have been aligned contrary to the usual Christian orientation, suggesting a far more permanent settlement. Um, and again, it's a shame we don't know what the orientation of the Viking grave would have originally been at Aberarth, because um, that probably would have told us a lot more about whether it was a pagan burial or a Christian burial. Um, so aside from burials, what other evidence do we have of possible Viking settlements in Wales? One of the ways in which we can study Viking culture in Wales is through linguistic evidence. The Vikings that came to Wales primarily arrived via the Irish Sea, and this is reflected in place naming practices, as most Norse place names in Wales identify coastal areas or navigational landmarks. Some well-known examples, um, so these are examples we've probably all heard of, um, so Swansea, that's something everyone knows, um, Swainsea, or Swains Island, uh, Milford Haven, Mellerfjordr, um, or Sand Sandbankfjord, um, Fishguard, or Fiskigarder, um, fish enclosure, which I assume is a fish trap, um, again, an indication of trade, um, Flatholm, Flatterholmer, um, the Flat Isle, uh, Steepholm, um, that's my own translation of Steepholm, so if anyone has any better suggestions, I'd be glad to hear them. Um, Stapeholmer, uh, the Concord Isle. Um, Bardsey, uh, Bardersey, or Barders Island. Um, Anglesey, or Unglesey, um, Ungles Island. Uh, they're very possessive, these Vikings. Um, <laughs> Great Orm, or Oromer, um, the Great Serpent. Again, a connection with uh, Norse mythology there. Um, so we can tell that these place names were used mainly by Vikings, as they do not correspond with their Welsh equivalents. And this lack of integration suggests that very few Vikings actually permanently settled in Wales. This lack of integration is also reflected in some medieval Welsh sources whose writers appear to have limited transferred knowledge of Scandinavia. For example, the writers of Brutatoris Sogion equated Norway rather confusingly with Germany. Despite this, it's worth noting that some Old Norse did make its way into the Welsh language, with two examples being um, Jarl or Jarl, so in Welsh, um, I A R W L um, for Earl, and Garth, meaning garden, um, from the Old Norse Garth, um, meaning, meaning the same thing, garden or enclosure. But how aware were the Vikings of the Welsh language? In Old Norse texts from medieval Scandinavia, Wales is universally referred to as Bretland and is presented as a, as a distinct part of the British Isles. The Old Norse history Algif Abnoris Canungasogum refers to Wales as Bretland, as do the sagas of Heimskringla and Orkneyinga saga, while Jomsvikinga saga refers to the Welsh people as Bredski. It's interesting to note that although some histories, such as the 12th century Latin history of Norway, written by the monk Theodoricus, also uses Bretland to refer to Wales and Cornwall, separately from Scotland or Ireland, suggesting an awareness of the relationship between the Brythonic languages. It's also worth noting here that in the 1978 translation of Orkneyinga saga, Herman Paulson and Paul Edwards point out that the term Bretland is also used to refer to the Kingdom of Strathclyde, again suggesting a Brythonic linguistic connection. As you're all probably aware, in the early medieval period, Strathclyde had been a Welsh-speaking part of Erhen Ogles, or the Old Norse, only a few generations prior to the Viking Age. It's perhaps strange to think of the Vikings as being linguistically talented, but as part of a culture that hardly ever wrote anything down and relied on oral composition for the transmission of their own history, it's certainly feasible to suggest that the linguistically talented Vikings and their history writers were aware of the Welsh language. <laughs>
the idea of Welsh-speaking Vikings is perhaps taking things a step too far. <laughs> but what these written sources tell us is that to the Vikings, Wales was not insignificant. Over the three centuries or so of the Viking Age, Norse contact with Wales played a significant part in placing Wales at the centre of important networks across the Irish Sea and beyond to Northern Europe and the Baltic. And the Vikings did not only bring with them violence and war, they also brought with them their culture, their religion and beliefs, their skills, their tales, their poetry and their language. The aim of this talk was to question the idea, both medieval and modern, that Vikings brought only piracy and destruction to Wales. And it's true that they do make it very difficult to shake this stereotype. Written sources and archaeological evidence is limited, making the breadth of our knowledge narrow. And there is much that I've mentioned in this talk that's disputable or may have to remain as guesswork. But hopefully I've highlighted the surprising scope of Viking culture in Wales and how Wales was perceived in the Old Norse world and that the Vikings who came to Wales were many things. Talented seafarers, warriors, poets, traders, linguists and pirates. So I'll finish by pointing out that Brutatoisogion tells us that Griffith ap Cunan, the closest thing that Wales has ever known to a Viking king, died in 1137. According to the Vita Graffini, he was mourned by all in the Irish sea world, the Welsh, the Irish and the Norse. Effectively, Griffith's death signalled the end of the Viking Age in Wales. Griffith's last words on his deathbed were words of encouragement to his sons to continue to resist the enemies of their kingdom. But from that point on, those enemies would no longer be the Vikings. Thank you. Dior. Well, I think we can say thank you very much to Lucy. That was absolutely fantastic and wonderful and very informative. And I think I agree that Vikings weren't all baddies. No. Particularly, what no. was it? Somebody deep thought, I liked him. Oh, the deep minded. Yeah, the deep minded. Huh? Anyway, we, <laughs> even, even though we started a bit late, we have uh, some time for questions. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, please uh, make yourselves known.